Hey everybody, welcome to Anarchy, the podcast about anime with two brothers. I'm Ben. And I'm a horrid animation goblin. Hmm. Isn't that what all these girls are? They're just horrid animation goblins? Isn't that the entire anime industry? Uh, you're not wrong. Hey, what have you been up to since last we spoke? Uh, I've been stuck inside. Really? I know, shocking. Uh, I started playing uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. I still need to buy a PS4. Well, so... Is it worth buying a PS4? I don't know. Oof. I want to like it more than it does. The story, the characters, the Japanese voice acting, amazing. Really good, really helps flesh out the world, is really great. Mm-hmm. I do not like the combat system. You don't? I don't, not That's at all. It's funny, because a lot of the reviews I've read are, or I love the combat system, which is surprising I to don't. me. But well, I don't like all these little side it. quests that they added. Yeah, some of those are a little like pointless. Here's my problem with the combat system. I don't like active combat in my JRPGs. Yeah. I just don't. I just don't like it. Final Fantasy has been doing that since what? 12? Yeah. 13? Yeah, since 12. I, I got used to it in 15 and I got to the point where I actually quite enjoyed 15 and because they have to change their combat system every game, I don't like it. They're not really changing it. They've just been improving on the exact same one. And by improving, I mean changing it, bolting things on, just, just changing it. The other issue is, is it suffers from a lot of uh, the complaints I would have about the way the gameplay is in uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, where by the time you actually get into the groove of the combat, it's over and you have to sit through a bunch more dialogue. Ugh. Now, I, I like the dialogue because in Kingdom Hearts 3, the dialogue was all kind of bad because uh, it's like, here, now watch Frozen for 15 minutes before you can actually go back to playing the game. And this is like interesting, intriguing and really fleshes out the world. Yeah, uh, a world I already know and want to know more about. But yeah, by the time you get into the combat, it's just like, OK, now stop. Now do this instead. To me, it's the other way around, right? It's like by the time I really get into the story and I'm really invested in it and I want to learn more, it's like, okay, now kill some gerblins <laughs> with a combat you don't particularly enjoy. And I'm like, oh. So how far okay. have you gotten in episode one, I guess? Oh, I just got to Don Coronado. Okay. I haven't, I haven't dressed up yet, but I'm in that area. I'm curious if they kept that in. I assume they did. They did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an it's integral part of, the, of the story. I mean, I cannot praise the sort of story Rika Jiggers and everybody's personalities and their acting enough because it's really well written, uh, very well scripted, and I, I like it a lot. But it does make me just want to go back and play Final Fantasy VII. You do, um, and then you go back and play it again. You're like, man, these graphics. Yeah, well. And the grindy bits. It has a lot of grindy bits once you live in Midgard. I just don't. I'm not a huge fan of the combat. Like, I understand they want to get away from turn-based i think there's they have this thing called classic mode which is really interesting and i think if square enix invested a lot of time and effort into that mm -hmm. it could be a good way forward to give you a classic jrpg turn-based battle experience but have it feel more dynamic because what classic mode does is it turns everybody's active combat into ai and then when your abt meter fills up you then use your abilities yeah. Now, in regular, you have to attack to fill up that little bar. But in this, the computer just does it. Hmm. Unfortunately, when you do that, it turns the enemies basically have no health, so they just kind of die as soon as somebody's ATB meter fills up. And the AI is kind of stupid. Well, you, you get that. I feel like if they really doubled down on that mode, it could be an interesting way forward to allow turn-based battles like we remember, but still have them feel more dynamic. See, I could get behind that. I would love to see that, but it's not super well implemented in this. I mostly play it on classic. Uh, sometimes I move back to normal. I kind of flip between because I keep trying to find a way to enjoy the combat. <laughs> and it's tough. It's good. Classic mode's really good when the battles are long. Uh, unfortunately, all the side quest battles are so easy on classic mode that they just die. And you're like, OK, well, sure. sure <laughs> I mean, well, I, that, th that wasted five minutes. Now, my key question then. Do they still have materia? Yes, they do. Does it work like it used to? Uh, mostly. Oh, good. I was really worried about that. I thought they'd go to some stupid thing like the sphere grid from 10. It's hard. I love the sphere grid. Shut up. It's hard to, it's hard to get away from materia. Materia is, is the best way of customizing. 
and it's a very important part of the game world, so you can't just junk it. Um, oh, they could have found a way if they wanted. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do like I like the sphere grid leveling system. This doesn't use that. Now, dress spheres, that's a different story. Dress spheres are fine. I do love Final Fantasy X too. Well, I mean, the top rated Final Fantasy game in Japan is Final Fantasy X. I don't understand that. But again, Ten's really good. They didn't have to deal with our dub. Yes, the biggest thing that hurts Final Fantasy X in the states is the dub being terrible. Now I have the special edition of Ten, which lets you play it on Japanese. Oh, it's so much better. I think I have that, but I haven't played it. Yeah, I mean Ten is excellent. Um, its leveling system is very good. It has turn-based battles. Thank you, and it's it's got a good, engaging story. Well, the plot's pretty paper thin. The other thing Especially I don't like game. about the the other thing I don't quite like about Remake is um, it really doesn't want you to explore anything. Like, you go forward, but you can't go back once you've gone forward, and that's very irritating. To be fair, the Midgar episode in the original game was pretty much the same thing. It was a, a rail system until you left the city. No, no, what I mean by that is, like, there will be a sequence where I'm like, oh, I need to go meet a character over there, but there's something behind me. Well, I'll go get my character and then go get the thing behind me. Nope, as soon as I get the character, they like yell at you that you're trying to turn around mm. and don't let you. And it's like, don't let me explore the map. You've loaded a whole map for me. Let me explore the whole freaking map until I'm off it. If I'm past the map, sure. Yeah, no, you can lock me out of areas. I'm not going to get mad. But you can't like have a map that I can bring up, but I can't go to parts of it after I've gone just a little bit beyond where they wanted me to go. That's mm -hmm. very frustrating. Makes sense. Well, have you watched any animes? Uh, have I? Uh, I finished up Carol on Tuesday. What was your end score on that? Uh, well, you know, it is still good. It's just, um, you know, the, the plot's very thin. Yeah. But the music's real great. It's a review. Yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. I've watched so much crap in the last two weeks. I've not, because I... I don't know why I've not. So oh, much. Oh, because I've been playing Final Fantasy, obviously. Oh, and Animal Crossing. So, let's see. So I watched Kakagurui, which we may talk yes. about in a future episode. Yeah, because I watched all of it, too. Which, if you're unfamiliar, it's on Netflix. You can watch it right now in your quarantine state. High recommend. If you've ever watched Akagi, it's... Uh, Ak Akagi. How can you not say this? Akagi. I knew it. I Whatever I said, you would say the opposite. It's Akagi, obviously. It's not hard. You took this language in college, and yet you still cannot say a name. That was almost 20 years ago, son. Uh, so, uh, I mean, <laughs> anyway, you're it's, not wrong, but come on. Kakagurui is basically high school full of Yandere girls who are all the embodiment okay. of Washi See, you said that they are not in any way Yandere. Aren't they? They are they are crazy, but there's no dairy dairy to any of them. They're all just bonkers. <laughs> and I love it, but they are just all insane. That's a fair interpretation. I'll give you yeah, that. None of them have any sort of dairy dairy moments, except maybe the eye patch girl, but she's mm. real bananas. <laughs> anyway, if you've if you've seen Washizu and you know what Washizu is, this is just a high school full of girls that have him that as, their, as, as their spirit animal. It's it is good. Do you, if you like gambling, you'll love it. It's very over the top, but in a very good way. What else did I finish up? Oh, I finished up uh, The Demon Next Door from uh, a season or two ago. That's the one where the girl wakes up and she's a demon. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Just to defeat the local magical girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's based off of four coma, turns out. Okay. So okay. It, there is a plot per se, not really. But it's a constant amount of jokes and they're good I mean, jokes. Good. It's not like, oh, we're going to have a serious episode then a somewhat humorous one. It's just a constant stream of silliness, which I appreciate. I needed that in my quarantine oh. days. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I watched ReZero. Did I tell you that last time? I don't even remember. ReZero. ReZero. No. Sorry, Rim. I love Amelia. ReZero. No. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know this one. I mean, I haven't watched it, but yeah, no, I know. I figured, you this, know what? This is not the one with ribbon tits. No, no, no. That, that's no, that's uh, that's girlfriends in dungeons. Correct. I figured I'm, I'm going to watch the rest of shows that were in Isekai Quartet. I've seen three of them. Might as well watch the other one. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, that's fair. So watch that one. It's fine. It's uh, it's fairly well established in its own world. 
it's not like Sword Art Online. Like it has cohesiveness. It's got pretty good characters. It can get etchy at times, but that's par for the course these days. I think now having watched all the shows from East Guy Quartet, I would rank them as Overlord, Yojo Sinki, ReZero, Shield Hero, and then Konosuba. Yeah, that's fair. Though Konosuba, I mean, that's kind of in its a league all of its own, kind of, because one of these things is not like the other. That's why it's last. Nice. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not one quite is, sure. You one can, is straight you laughs. Can... The other ones are, they got something going on. Yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure I would even say it would be last. It's just over somewhere else doing its own thing. And this won't mean anything to you, but for those who are listening that are in the know, Rim is not best girl. Amelia is not best girl. It's obviously Ram, and you all can suck it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so random, random access memory is best girl. Correct. Okay. And then I am all caught up on Railgun. I've been feeling the itch to rewatch Railgun. I rewatched the entire first season. I kept watching and I have to tell you that while a lot of Railgun is, it feels very spinoffish because it was a spinoff. Yeah. The sisters arc in season two is probably some of the best sci-fi anime that I've seen in a long time. The thing about Railgun being a spinoff, it's one of those things where the spinoff is kind of better than the original. It's way better. By a long shot. And here's how good the sister's arc is. Do you know anything about the sister's arc? I sh- I'm positive I've seen it. I don't remember, but I know I've seen okay. it. Because I've seen the first two seasons of Railgun. So. Very mild spoilers. That's the arc where uh, Makoto has a bunch of clones and she finds out about it. Okay. Do you remember the clones? Uh, I mean, I just watched the newest episode of Star Wars Clone Wars, so I remember some clones, but it's different clones. (laughs) There are clones of Misaka, who's best girl. Sure. And they're adorable, and there are a bunch of them, and none of them really show up except for one in the intervening seasons since then. They all show up in Index. And here's how they get you, is now I'm feeling... Maybe I should go watch Index. Don't watch the Index. I'm not going to watch bad. Index because every once in a while the plop Index into my real gun. I'm like, that bitch got to go. And then I catch myself thinking, I should watch Index. Or don't watch Index. It's kind of bad. It's real bad. The plot makes no sense. And the main characters are awful. Yeah. I mean, it's not good. Oh. Index is bad. Real gun, very good. But I have to get a shout out to, uh, I found the best subreddit. Okay. Which is r slash one Best true bd bd which is nothing okay. but masaka so it is Ooh, i can wear her little uniform in animal crossing yes you can uh there's also one for uh what's her face index uh, uh i believe there is one for index there is and i hate it no i mean this is a no, pretty, there's one a pretty for good Kuriko. subreddit not, not gonna lie pretty good subreddit i will disagree with one of their rules uh one which of is? their rules is that toma is the OTP for for Misaka, which I adamantly disagree with. She don't need no man. I mean, sure. That that's all I have to say about that. I hate when he shows up. Isn't her OTP electricity? Eh, it's Pikachu. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hey, you want to talk about more animation? Literally. Sure. Yeah, absolutely, I do. Let's talk about the uh, Azekin, the uh, Film Research Club. So this week we watched Keep Your Hands Off Azokin. And I did misspeak last episode. I said Azokin comes from E as in picture. It does not. I lied. You did lie. I did lie. It comes from E as in film. Yeah. Yeah. Which are both E, but but different kanji. So this particular thing was uh, directed by the same guy that did Kaiba. Okay. Look, you not have short. to say it's by the... Night is short, walk let's, on girl, and Tom yeah, of the Galaxy. Yeah, let's pick the good ones first. <laughs> why, why you're burying the lead when you're like, it's directed by the guy who did Kaiba. You know, that weird acid trip that you, you watched. How far did you get into Kaiba, by the way? I'm Not still on episode two. Of course you are. Yeah, you said you thought you thought you could handle it. I did. No one can handle Kaiba. It was hubris on my part. You would think out of anybody, I'd be able to handle it. Because I'm like, oh, a weird artsy thing? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. No problem. Uh Uh-uh. No, no, it's too much. Yep. Yep. It is what it is. Uh, Yeah, it's Kaiba is what it is. Either way, this is is directed by the Kaiba guy. Or the Tatami Galaxy guy, if we want to 
talk about something that's good. Yes, the Atomic Galaxy guy. Like, Which, it's hard to if say if you remember, Kyber's bad. It's just I Kyber. gave that a solid 10. Yeah, you know, Atomic Galaxy is amazing. It is amazing. Night of Short, Walk On Girl is not too far off. Yep. Oh, look, he also did uh, Ping Pong, Space Dandy. Yeah, and, I know he did uh, Ping Pong. What is this? Something coming what up. What is this? It's a novel called Japan Sinks. Apparently sure. it's an anime that's coming out this year at some point. Oh, says well. Wikipedia. Says Wikipedia. Yeah, well, everything's delayed, so it probably won't be out until who knows. Anyway. Anyway. You want to give the short elevator pitch for Azuken? Three high school goblins decide to make an anime. They make several anime. At least they three. They make several anime. They make three. It's really a love story to the anime industry. It is. Well, no, it's a love story to not the anime industry, to animators and, anima- and the animation industry. I think you want two different things here, because if you say the uh, uh, a love letter to the anime industry, you can get into some real weird stuff with the anime industry culture. All right, you're right. But this you're is fine. far more into just like the artistry of animation and creativity in general. And yeah, creative the, the creative part. Absolutely. It's very good at explaining how these things are done and how everyone hates the things they make. Everybody hates the things they make. I know that for firsthand. What's that wonderful quote they have at the end of the first animation arc? I'd say it's less about finishing or completing the project and more the outcome of passion crashing against compromise and resignation. These are true facts. Truer words, man. It's one of the best lines ever, (laughs) ever written. So what were your high level thoughts? It's very good. And anyone who cares about how animation is actually made needs to watch it. And anyone who wants to like armchair talk about any creative process needs to watch it. Yes, they should absolutely should like those it. people who are just like, well, they should just make blank an open world game, especially armchair game devs <laughs> also need to watch it because they're the worst. And a lot of the stuff in this applies to that sort of idea, too. I like how it showed the various aspects of how the creative process works and, mm-hmm. it's, and especially one that is often overlooked. That's the producer. Like we all like, know. like to lavish praise on the director for having the vision and the animators for having the talent. But, oh, but the producer. But man, you got to have the that best producer. Character. <laughs> yeah, she's the best character because she's just like, look, no, no, this is how it works or nothing happens. She's my spirit animal because that is the role I have at my job. Yeah. It's like, look, I know you want to do that very interesting thing, but you got to do this thing first. Yeah, this is important. But yeah, I give it. Uh, how what would I give it if I had a rank? It? Mm, probably an eight. There's so many like good things about it, like how whenever they discuss an animation technique, they'll use it in the episode, but they won't like call it out. Yeah. How how well they are at like showing them making an uh, an anime in three episodes, but making it feel like they earned it. And like you feel how hard they worked on it. Where so many shows where that involves something creative, just sort of montage it and you don't feel like they worked that hard. Where in this, like they all hate themselves by the end of it. <laughs> they really sell you on they worked very, very, very hard to make this happen. That's very Instead true. of like the idol shows where it's just like we did it. Yay. We worked hard. You, we showed one scene of them practicing in front of a mirror and sweating. And look, they did it because they worked so hard. In this, they're like crawling out from under tables at 5 a.m. Being like, I think I got it kind of somewhere the way I kind of like it. It's Everyone presentable. will hate it, though. <laughs> Everyone will hate it, though. And I hate it most of all. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, that's how it actually works. Thank you for showing that. It's like there's only two other series that are like this, I think. One is... Shiro Bako, uh, which we have the not watched here. The other one is My Dad Makes Hentai, right? That's the name of that show. I'm not going to watch My Dad Makes Hentai. That's No, <laughs> forget that exists. Why, why do you even remember that? <laughs> so many questions. Spite, no, mostly. But Shiro Bako is more like, how do adults handle it in the anime industry? You get to see the inner workings, blah, blah, blah. It's more of the type of anime where, hey, guys, come work in this industry. That type of show. Uh, the other one is maybe Nozaki-kun. Nozaki Kun's very similar. I would say that it at least shows how hard people work, but it's more it's more geared towards, you know, the the character interactions more than the manga yeah, itself. Yeah. Whereas this is obviously more geared towards the creative process. But mm-hmm. like you said, all the other shows that deal with the similar vein is, yeah, we're going to have a quick montage and then they just win. OK, not necessarily win, but I mean, they finish it. 
They finish and it it's and like, it's great. And they're all very proud of it. And like I understand the complexities in showing that because no one wants to see that because it's it's boring. Hard work is boring to watch. But this show manages to strike the balance of making it interesting to watch, skipping over enough, but still stressing things correctly mm-hmm. and constructing its story in such a way that all of their hard work feels like it was legitimately very hard work for them. I think if I had to detract from the show a little bit, it's that there are some plot threads that are introduced that do not resolve. And I don't know if yeah. that's just because it's based on a manga from 2016 running to present. Maybe they just ran out of material and those will resolve later. But given the niche-ish manner of the show, I don't see it having a second season. I mean, I doubt that very much. I would like it to, but it doesn't. It also it's very artistic. It also doesn't need one, which is good. It's very self-contained. But there are some things that need to be wrapped up that aren't. Each character had their own little episode to themselves, which was good. Mm-hmm. But in the context of you've only got this much time. We could probably could have paired that back a little bit and showed more yeah. of the creative process. But those are just nitpicking things. There were a couple episodes where I was like, eh, especially early on. There was like like every arc, maybe not every arc. There's probably like two dead episodes in the show where I'm like, eh, we probably could have done something other than this. I'm going to be honest. When I started watching it, I it was one of those shows where I was like, I have to watch this because we're going to review it. And it wasn't yeah. until episode, I think, six, it finally grabbed me. I'm like... Oh, I got to see what happens now. Episode one was extremely good. Two, three were a little slighty. But once they sit down to make their machete anime is when it really picks up. I think it was uh, Mizaki's episode. So that would have been episode seven, six or seven. Somewhere oh, that one's very good. That was probably the best episode. Uh, her arc is very good. And I love the way they portray the relationship with her parents in a real believable way where the parents are not antagonists they just want what's be- what they think is best and then they learn oh wait this is still fulfilling for her and what we want for her and everything's fine because we're communicative adults well let's back up for a second so spoiler alert this is where we talk about details and stuff okay very character driven show from yes. each per- each participant's contribution to the process right so let's start with the most goblin of goblins. The most goblin of goblins. Let's go from most to least goblin. <laughs> most goblin is Asaksa. Absolutely. Who, despite having been told over and over and over, this is a girl in this school. Didn't believe it. <laughs> She's in a dress. Still don't believe it. I love her so much. She's a horrid little goblin. <laughs> She's probably the most accurate tomboy character I've ever seen. Uh, yeah, and a horrible social misfit. A yes. Suck. So yeah, she's a... F- are they all first years? I think they are. I think so. Yeah, I think they're all first years at, at the high school. And she's she's the dreamer, right? She got a... She always has ideas. She looks at anything and ideas just flood out to a fault. Yes, absolutely to a fault. <laughs> that is the best picture. And I don't know uh, why I should all pictures of her are the best, <laughs> except this one. This one's awful. It's like somebody was like, she should be cute. Ugh, it's like, no, no, she's a horrible goblin. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> she's a horrid goblin and should always be a horrid goblin. <laughs> but the way she sees anime and animation in general is it's all about the setting, which yes. is good because that comes back to what we talked about last time, which is that the the medium is the message. And she gets yeah. that at a fundamental level. She's all about believability making sure everything works and that it makes logical sense that's the one thing that i'm not gonna take issue with but is really rare like the creative types i know generally don't think about the logical consequences of what they're designing for right yeah that's true i mean like lots of people are like that they they want to rule of cool it too much or it's like there's there's a limit there is a limit and she butts up against that limit constantly it gets yeah. into the like the whole thing where i what I have against like Brandon Sanderson, where, oh, I built this world and now, now I have to make everything make logical sense, even though it's built on a system of magic. Like, no, you don't. It's magic. It's a fantastical world. We bought into that when we bought your book or we're watching your show. It doesn't yeah. all have to make concrete sense. Why are you pandering to the one percent of people that are going to, you know, scrunch the glasses up on the on their face? And being, well, actually, yeah, 
It's like those are the worst people to pander to. But I think Asoxa just can't help herself. Well, it reminds me a lot of the person who did the original designs for the robots in Macross, where he really wanted to make sure that they made sense and worked. Still, they're still they're kind of impractical because no one would actually make them do this. But he worked very hard to make sure that it all worked and made sense. It's kind of like the novel series uh, Sekai no Manchu, Crest of the Stars. Oh, yeah. That author like built his own conlang. He made all these spaceships and things like viable spaceships and combat works correctly and like different types of space time and like that that stuff's well thought out and then he ruined it by getting too in deep with his conlang well i mean it's kind of it's the tolkien's that same way i always like to go back to tolkien because he he did a bunch of that stuff but he had the common sense to hide it so <laughs> no one had to see it you're just seeing what is inspired by the stuff that i've hidden exactly and you're like it makes the world feel very deep and rich, but you get so many fantasy authors that are like, well, you should see all of the work I put into this. It's like, no, I don't care. Which, I guess. I, I want to see the end of it. I mean, if you think about it, Asoxa basically takes that approach. Oh, yeah. No, she absolutely does. Because she thinks about all this crap and, and paints all these watercolor pictures with all these diagrams and explanations and details. And then the final product, there has no dialogue. None of that oh, gets yeah. explained. The, the medium should help you understand exactly what it what it's doing. And I think that's why the to it works. The audiences are so blown away. Yeah, because she has put that thought into it. Uh, a great example of this is, of course, her robot design, where she has a breakdown because there's no way the robot should work. And it's very dumb <laughs> and she hates it. And then she like then they're like, well, too bad. This is the robot design. You have to deal with it. And then she like shows them a picture of, look, I made all of its internal guts work. So. <laughs> We did it. <laughs> I fixed Hooray. it. So is anybody going to see this? No. No, but we fixed it. Okay, Asakusa. <laughs> pat, pat. Pat, pat. You did it. She also embodies that whole, like, self-doubt thing that is integral to being at least somewhat successful at being creative. It's the sucky part yeah. of the whole thing. Because you build it, and you know what your skill set is, and you know that people have done it better, and you still can't get there. And even when you do get there, you're still going to find somebody who's better. And you're always going to be not only judging your work against their stuff, but you're also going to judge it against what was in your head. And yeah. what you ultimately create is never what was in your head. Never. And it sucks. It's very hard. It's probably why I don't draw. Because every time I draw, it doesn't look anything like what was in my head. And then I throw it away. and be like, ah, uh, it's rubbish. Never doing this again. It's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. All right. What about... Kanamori. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about the person who changes all of the rubbish into gold by putting sane limits on things. The producer. She's great. She's awesome. Her character design rules. She's very good. She's the best. She means well. But man, she has an iron fist, which you need. You have to have. Oh, yeah. In these situations. And it's like the show at first is told mostly from Asakusa's point of view. And it seems like, man, Kanamori's kind of mean. And she's she seems really demanding. But as the show progresses and we sort of pull away to focus on the group as a whole, you realize, oh, yeah, this group would not function if Kanamori oh, wasn't not. here and constantly hitting them on the head. Oh, yeah. And constantly being the reality that hits them. It's like, guys, yes, I know that you're having an amazing idea spasm right now. That's great for you. However, we've got uh Three days to finish this thing up. How much have you figured out our plot yet? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Commence the violence. And she also has very good business sense. Yeah, she has a great backstory and her backstory episode is amazing and I love her. <laughs> oh, her, her uncle had a convenience store that was See, slowly failing because, you know, economy changes. If adult uh, Kanamori is your spirit animal. Child <laughs> Minimori is definitely mine. How so? Which is, how am I going to make money off of this? <laughs> Watch these clever business things I can do to make money. Hooray. Oh, by the way, we're closing the store. Trauma. Damn it. <laughs> Drama. But yeah, I don't think she gets enough credit even in, in the show. The director's obviously telling us, hey, this character is probably, at least from a production standpoint, the most important person. If you don't have oh, this absolutely. person, nothing's going to get done because your dreamers are going to dream and you got oh, yeah. to keep them in line. 
Got to keep them on on target. You got to make sure that they know what their priority stack is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is what I do at work. So programmers and they do the yeah. exact same thing. Oh, this is a nifty piece of kit that I just found on whatever website. Like that's oh, neat. Every, every, Why don't you think about that later when you're done? Every, every creative field has this this issue, right? I mean, I do it myself, honestly. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone I'm very, does. I'm very good at at keeping other people in line. But when it comes to me, it's like, hey, I'm going to work on this project. I'm, I'm making real progress. Oh, it's getting close to getting. Ooh, other thing. Look at that. I'm going to go do that. And then nothing gets done. So you always have to have a Kanamori in your life. Yeah, buddy. And then we have Least Goblin. So in the show, it's constantly pronounced Masakshi. Yeah. Well, no, they, they just they use the honorific she for everybody. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, but so Asakushi Mizusaki. So this is the model. She's a yes. model. Uh, daughter of two famous, well, one famous actor and one ishish famous actor. And she's a amateur model. She's in the school. She's pretty famous. But turns out she's a giant dork. Yes. And she would rather be doing dork stuff than model stuff. And... The dorkiest kind of dork, which is an animation dork. Somebody who thinks that the height of animation is watching somebody tumble down a hill. One, she is correct. That is a very hard to do, sophisticated bit of animation. Two, very few people notice or care. <laughs> and that's something that is she butts up against all the time with Kanamori. Yeah, but it doesn't look the way I think it, it should look. Well, that's neat. I can't tell the difference. It's fine. Yeah, no, no one can tell the difference except the animation nerds who are like, yes, you're right. Hands actually do move that way. And I'm so glad that you animated it that way. Too bad it doesn't matter. True. I liked the, the scene with her grandma where she gets really mm-hmm. interested in watching T get flung out into the yard. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. It's like a very simple motion. And she's like, I can't get enough of that. Her backstory episode and... Kanamori's backstory episodes are probably two of the best of the whole show. Agreed. 100%. And I think Miyazaki has probably the best one, or at least the best backstory, because she has it's external conflicts as well. Uh, yeah. Kanamori and Asakshi, or Asaksa, basically have the, they have their internal struggles, I guess, just with growing up, but Miyazaki has the Yeah, she has the, the external biggest external well. conflict. Well, and I love how it resolves itself, too, where her parents see because they want her to be an actress and she they've pretty much banned her from anime because she they don't want her to be an animator until they realize that her animating is a form of her acting because of how she, how the attention to detail she has put in everything and just watching how people and things move. See, and, and this is the nice thing is that their drive to make her an actress made her a better animator. Because they mm. put her in ballet and they put her in acting class and all those things. And she learned how people move. Yeah. She would focus on that. I mean, it shows in the final result, doesn't it? Yeah. Like how they hold their chopsticks wrong. But I also like the thing where, uh, especially in the third arc, where Kanamori's like, look, we still need to make money. Otherwise, we're going to run out of funds and we're not going to be able to do anything that we want to do. What is our greatest asset? And both of them are like, well, it's our drive and our vision and our art. And <laughs> she's like, beautiful animation. No, no. It's the fact that she's a model and she's very popular. <laughs> it's the fact that she is famous. We can milk that for all it's worth. And they do. And they do. Very tastefully, though. Yeah. There's like, yeah, you just, you're going to sign some stuff. You're going to be there. You're going to sign things. You're going to be the face of this club because it yeah. sure as hell isn't going to be a Saksa. Oh, <laughs> Gosh, no. She's a horrid animation gremlin. <laughs> Annie found some just like awesome animation of the three characters in like a little walk cycle. And they're just very cartooned and the most gremlin. And I wish I could find it again. Oh, but it's somewhere lost to time. So then back up a uh, bigger picture. I do like how they keep butting up against the student council in the school. Yeah, it's in the story and it's there for story's sake because he needs some sort of antagonist but i feel like it's actually trying to say something about locking kids and their potential up in those school settings like it's clearly saying something like hey let them do what they got to do and let them make money you let the sports teams yeah. make money why won't you let these guys make money which is a good question why don't they i don't know because life's hard i guess but i do like Conor Mori's attitude towards the 
the teacher. Oh, she's very good because she just tells him what's what. She's like, aren't you supposed to be preparing us for the real world? Well, yes. Well, how is not letting us make money preparing us for the real world? Well, you're not supposed to be having a business. Having a business is preparing us for the real world. Yeah, but you need to be innocent here. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but here you're not supposed to worry about those things yet. It's like, yeah, but if you're preparing us for the real world, shouldn't we be worrying about the, <laughs> those things now? And she takes responsibility for that. She's like, yeah, screw you guys. Uh, yeah. Last episode, I think. Yeah, they're running up against that deadline. And the, they needed to have those DVDs printed. And the music doesn't work, turns out. Oh, yeah. Which they didn't check beforehand. Music doesn't work. They've run out of time. And it's like, well, sucks. Sucks to suck. Like, this is now your problem because this you've divorced yourself from the school's oversight to be yep. able to be more independent, which means you have to take the the knocks as well. And she's just like, yep, I canceled it. And then I'm going to browbeat them into taking it anyway, like an hour afterwards with an axe. Yeah, I did like the blurring of fantasy and, and reality throughout the oh, show. Oh, it's very well done. Because it really shows you how the creative people see the world. Mm -hmm. And explain it to other people and suck them in. Yeah. Especially when they were talking about like the underwater clock and the student oh, council yeah. secretary shows up. Like, yep. it got, she got dragged in to one layer of abstraction. And then we spent an a very long time with the audio girl just listening to the bong over and over and over and over in like another layer of abstraction. Mm -hmm. So it's like different ways of, of viewing these abstract concepts in, in animation, which is the only way you can do this. Making really good use of the medium. Oh, I do wish they'd make another season. Apparently there was a live action film. Yeah, well, uh, uh, live action film for TV. I don't know why they would think that because this is an animation show about animation with yeah animation driving the whole thing. Like why why would you change this into a? I mean they could uh, they could sort of morph it in a way, right? As long as the the thing the there's as long as they take a lot of time and care into the things that they animate. Like if if you do the animation actually animated, it would be very good. I guess if they rotoscope over it, but that's probably the only and way they, you're going to do it. They can also be clever. But then we get into Akinohana territory. People uh, hate everything yes. because they're. Yeah, no, it is what it is. It is what it is. Well, anything else you want to say about Azuken? No, go go watch it. It's very good. If you like anime at all, you should watch it. The animation's fantastic. The only downside I would say is that the for as good as the animation is, you'd think the opening would be extremely well animated. No, nah, it's passable. Though it's a, it, I think it's by choice, right? They want to highlight the animation in the episode. Well, and they don't want there to show is it up that by having a very good. You, you could also go well one animated. level deeper and say, hey, this is sort of reflecting of the robot arc where they wanted to have a theme and then nothing worked out. So they scrapped <laughs> the whole idea. Yeah. So maybe this is a uh, nod to that. I doubt that the theme song itself is very good and I like it a lot, but the the animation is fine. Yeah, that's all she wrote on that. What are we going to watch next time? Uh, I don't know. We could probably just record Kakegurui because we've already seen it, so I don't have to watch anything. You could do that. I can talk about more of the shows I've watched because I've watched so so much because there's nothing to do. Uh, yeah, more or less. It's basically correct. A few more things to do. The only things I have to look forward to these days is Cookie Clicker and binging anime making my neck hurt. That's it. Don't sit in front of your computer all day. Go, yeah. go outside, take a walk. Go live your life. Live your life or something. Liberate yourselves. No. Don't die, or though. Something. Don't get sick. Uh, you know, try not to. All right. Be See bad. you next time. Bye forever. Bye forever.